in the past few weeks we've been taking the uh, Matthew's version of the Sermon on the Mount and uh, again it's a bridge it's not quite the same in the six chapters of Luke because that's a Sermon on the Plain but this Sermon on the Mount is again the manifesto of the Kingdom of Jesus it could be said that it's, it, it is uh, an almost word uh, perfect letter or life of the Lord Jesus Christ himself <clears throat> we thought about the the fact that, that, that anybody no, there's no class distinction no priorities for scholarship no priorities for wealth no priorities for kingship but everybody that enters the kingdom must enter it the same way blessed are the poor in spirit and that poor means emptying out of ourselves all arrogance and self-sufficiency and feeling that we're approachable to God that the, for some strange quirk that we do not need redemption that we can work our way through a church or, or through some other religious efforts and become children of God which is pure nonsense in the light of the word of God blessed are the poor in spirit and then blessed are they that mourn they mourn over their poverty and then blessed are the meek and in each case there's a compensation blessed are they that mourn for they receive the comfort of God blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the blessed are the poor blessed are they that mourn for the compensation is they shall be comforted blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth <coughs> now verse 6 of Matthew 5 says blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled blessed are they which do hunger and thirst you know often when we've gone out west <coughs> and we've got into the desert areas and you know it, it gets hot and even if, if you have air conditioning on your car the, the sun is striking through the upper part of the car your chest is hot and your legs are freezing nearly with your air conditioner and you pull your shades down if you have them and, and then before long the desert seems like a sheet of white paper and almost every time we've gone I've said to my dear wife well however did those pioneers come over here without shades without you know they couldn't stop and get uh, there wasn't even a McDonald's in those days <clears throat> there wasn't a place to get a, a cup of cold water they were scared to death of being attacked by Indians but above all it, it's the, uh, the the drama the the, the, um, the uh, what shall I call it the carriage of men to pioneer through the wilderness well you know in one area when they were doing this they'd made a breakthrough they'd made a kind of a settlement and they startled the Indians and the Indians decided on a massacre and there was a famous Indian by the name of Black Eagle. He had a double dose of devilry in him, and he was going to slaughter these people who had come into his territory. And uh, they, they'd heard that on Sunday morning that these people all gathered together to, to sing hymns. And so he planned the massacre for that morning, and, you know, with the skill that Indians have, they, they could swing from tree to tree and then slide through the grass and... It was such a hot day, they had all the windows open, the door open, and they just stopped singing as these men were snaking their way through the grass. And then they heard a dignified man begin to read, Blessed are the poor in spirit, put his finger up to the brave. And they listened right through, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they seek God. Well, then he said, if this is the white man's teaching, we need them. We shouldn't destroy them. At the other end of the scale, the great, some people think the greatest, uh, of course, um, president America ever had, that's been disputed, of course, some think it was Washington, I suppose it was because it's part English, <coughs> but uh, I think actually Abraham Lincoln is usually considered the greatest all of all. <coughs> you know, not too long before he was dying, a friend went to see him and he had a Bible on his knee. And he began to talk about the things he'd done and the things he hadn't done and he said well I'm not so sure about if I'm really pure in heart I'm not so sure about a number of things but this I am sure about I hunger and I thirst after righteousness it's a pity we hunger and thirst hunger is normal thirst is normal I remember a lady whose name you all know I won't tell you who she is but uh, she came and took a convention that we had over in the Bahamas in a beautiful mansion there and uh, after one meeting she came home almost breathless she said brother Raymond I've never seen such hunger oh man the hunger the people's questions oh I've never seen such hunger in my life 
So what? What's, what's wrong with that? If your child comes in hungry, Mother, I want you... Yeah, I gave you something an hour ago. You don't say, you're hungry again? Oh, get in the car, let's take you to the doctor's. You expect a, a normal child to be hungry. You expect to be thirsty. And if you and I are normal in our Christian life, it's not abnormal to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And the compensation is that if we hunger and we thirst after righteousness, we should be filled. Now righteousness, amongst other things, means purity, it means moral rectitude, it means being straight in our relationship with God. And you'd imagine that if we lived in a world like this, living this attitude, that the world would welcome us and say, well, I want a righteous man. They used to tell me when I was a boy that if the devil was in business, he wouldn't let his own kids be the treasurer and secretary. Well, maybe that's true. He wanted Christians to run the cashier's desk, you know, if the devil was in business. He wanted Christians to run the other sections of it. And yet it's strangely true that in this same statement that Jesus makes, verse 10 says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Isn't it a strange world in which we live? If you murder somebody, they'll, they'll put you in jail, not for too long, just till they change the beauty red, the red beds and get colored TV. And you'll get out, skillful lawyer will get you out. Uh, if you go to war and you drop a bomb on the city and liquidate it and kill a hundred thousand people, you'll maybe get a big medal. And yet if you're righteous, you'll get to jail as well. Isn't that the history of the Puritans? Weren't those old wonderful Presbyterians back in, what, 1665 massacred by the English? They didn't like the way they stood up for the things of God. They wouldn't be pressed into a mold of Romanism, and so they stood up. And, and the, the, there are just incredible stories of their suffering. Young men in their uh, 23, 24 years of age, marching to the scaffold with their shoulders back. When one said to one of them, uh, oh, oh, ach, he was weeping. And uh, somebody uh, in the crowd, they, this was a fellow called Huey that was going to the gallows. The fellow in the crowd was called Huey. And Huey goes down the street with his shoulders back, six feet three of him, with a smile on his face. And he turns right and this guy sees him and went, oh, Huey, Huey is crying. Ah, Huey stopped and pointed and said, man, why are you greeting? In Gaelic, greeting is greeting. Greeting is, is weeping. Why are you weeping? Ah, oh, Huey, Huey. Ah, oh, you're such a fine young man. You're the great, you're our apostle Paul and you're going to die. I hear you're going to die. Ah, oh, man, he says, going to die? In three days, I'm going to see the king in all his beauty. Now, what do you do when you kill a man like that? You don't, you don't uh, spoil his life. He, in other words, you say, I'm just going to start living. I've seen the king. I'm going to see the king in all his beauty. No, no trembling and say, well, couldn't you get a, 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 make an appeal and go to the king and the governor and try and get me off it? I mean, I'm only 24 years of age and I don't want to let my head roll in the dust. And they used to stick them on a spike outside of Edinburgh Cathedral. As a sign of humiliation. I never knew a corpse to be humiliated anyhow, but that was something that they passed on to them. But you see, they lived in the, in the area of the spiritual. Well, when, when these, these beautiful things here are all internal. You see, Jesus, a little later in this very chapter, he says, um, in verse 20, I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes, and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, again, you, you've got to think of Jesus. I, I get sick, I, ugh, I get weary of all the pictures of Jesus. We don't have a picture of Jesus in our home. I wouldn't have one. If you're a good artist, paint me an eagle, but don't paint me a picture of Jesus. It'll go in the garbage can. And if your grandfather has one that's worth a lot of money, well, sell it and give it to missions. I don't believe anybody has a true portrait of Jesus. And, and, uh, and when I see portraits of Jesus, I kind of shrink because usually he's effeminate, you know, has a nice dress on that's been so well pleated and, and his hair's faultless and whatnot. I don't believe Jesus was like that. I think Jesus was about six feet four. I think he was rugged, uh, Jewish in appearance, a nice beard. Kindness oozed out of him. I don't think he was like any of the pictures that men have given us of him. But you know, the thing that comes back to me time and time again is the heroism of Jesus. You see, when he's talking here, I don't doubt the Pharisees were on the edge of the crowd and the Sadducees. 
You know the difference between the two, the pun we have on that. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection and the Sadducees didn't. That's why they were Sadducees. <coughs> All right. But uh, that, that's a fact. Now, Jesus is living in constant antagonism. He doesn't go in a corner and say what he thinks is wrong with mankind. He shouts it from the housetop. He went the last day, the great day of the feast, in the seventh chapter of, of John. That temple held 6,000 people because there's a record of one when somebody uh, uh, spilt some holy water or something there and there was a riot in the temple and the 6,000 people and hundreds of people were trampled. And Jesus stood up on the last day, the great day of the feast. The previous six days, the temple orchestra had gone down the shore of the hill to the pool of Siloam. They'd taken a, 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 an urn made of a, a pure gold, not solid because there was water in it, but it was pure gold. And at a given point, they lifted water out of that pool, put it on the shoulder of the priest, and he balanced it there, and the orchestra stood up, and they praised, and they magnified the Lord. And in the middle of the temple, they poured it out six days in a row. Why? To remind them that one day, God, the God of Elijah, the God of miracles, split the rock, and that water became the water of life to them. <coughs> on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood in exactly the same place, with thousands of people looking up. Now the Jews believed it was their prerogative. There was only one God, and he only had one family. They were the Jews. And, and so they're recording the history of what God has done with them. And on the last day, Jesus went and stood in that very place. He didn't pour any water out. They didn't pour any water out. He stood there and said so courageously, it thrills me, that Jesus stood there and hollered right through the test. Now, Isaiah says, My servant Christ shall not cry in the streets. He didn't cry in the streets. He cried in the temple. After all, they didn't have any amplification. How in the world do you think 6,000 people? Maybe he put his hand up and he cried, If any man thirst. What do you mean, any man? The Jews have a monopoly on God. You mean the Greeks? Anybody else can come? If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He didn't say to the socialites, Come, or the millionaires, come, or, or the distinguished scholars, come, or the rabbis, come. He said, If any man, he cuts the whole thing down. Last Sunday we tried to think of what is called the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. T.E. Triumphal entry. Was it a triumphal entry or was it a tearful exit? You remember the scripture? We use it at Christmas usually, though I never heard a sermon on it on TV or radio or anywhere at Christmas. He came unto his own and his own received him not. Not once. He came unto his own again in the, in the temple that day with 6,000 people. Do you think they accepted him? They actually sent some men to arrest him. If you read the first verse of that chapter, it says that when he went to the temple, uh, the, the Jews sought to kill him. And yet he walked bang into the middle of the trap. He's like a man going into the middle of a cage of, of wild tigers, and he has no defense on him, and he walks in the middle and he's going to say hi like that. What the tiger's going to do? Chew him up? But even with a price on his head, he's still in the middle of the feast there. And he said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Now, he marched into Jerusalem. Each one of the evangelists recorded it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the answer to Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Rejoice, rejoice greatly, O Zion. Thy king cometh unto thee, meek and lowly, and sitting upon an ass, and upon a colt, the fall of an ass. You see, a beast that was going to be used in a... In a, in a sacrificial ceremony or a holy ceremony must never have been used it must be totally clean and so he sat on what? he sat on a, on a donkey what type of a donkey? a young donkey, a coat where on? no man ever sat now I understand you can you, I've seen men train horses I understand you can't train a donkey the only, way, the only way you break it is get on its back if you can stay on you maybe I'll be on your back in the next minute but that's the way you break it in and Jesus gets astride a wild colt because in the beginning God had promised that Adam should have dominion over all the animals. And he comes, not the second Adam, he's the last Adam, and he has dominion. But he goes through the streets of Jerusalem. There were over a million people. Josephus, if you can trust him, says there were six million people in the city at that time. It was the greatest celebration. It was the Passover. Isn't it awful, isn't it dreadful to think as we celebrate tomorrow the crucifixion of Jesus, that they actually slaughtered a lamb that very day in the temple that the Lamb of God was hanging on a cross and they didn't even understand it? Isn't it amazing that it says the same thing? 
that they said if Jesus comes this way we'll, we'll get him we'll arrest him why didn't they I mean this is a, this is a silly thing this is a carnival I mean did you ever see a king go riding into a, a into a capital city with a few sweaty old garments on the back of a donkey and thought that had nothing to give to some uh, palm leaves off and uh, only John I think it is mentions that and, and uh, that they were palm leaves and they strewed the way well the Romans must have laughed their heads off <laughs> you should see Caesar come into Rome when Caesar comes in he has a chariot blazing red and it's drawn with white horses and he has slaves to fan him and, and all man everybody bows down and says hail Caesar and all you have here is a few screaming women saying hail to this man they say is the son of God I think Jesus maybe as a human being he felt very humiliated about it but again the bravery that he marched into the city when there was a price on his head now again he's speaking these truths and if you notice very carefully in the uh, in the third verse it says blessed are the poor in spirit now he's talking to a third bunch there when you come further down he says in verse 13 blessed are ye blessed are ye he talks to a, a, a third party when he says blessed are the poor he talks to a second party when he says blessed are ye and then he comes right down to speak uh, verse 18 for verily I say unto you now let's go back into verse 17 think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets I'm not come to destroy the law but to fulfill now that word fulfill is mentioned twice in this uh, I was going to say epistle uh, in, in Matthew which is obviously the first gospel but fulfilled is mentioned 16 times in Matthew he's trying to get through the, the, this, this gospel is mainly addressed to Jews and he's trying to get through to them that all that their fathers prophesied is fulfilled in himself he is the, the ultimate of all that the prophets declared now they don't like this he says you say that Moses said I say unto you where did he get his authority why when he went in the temple they sent a bunch of men to arrest him and when they got back the chief priest said well well where is he he has no bodyguard where is he we sent you to arrest him and he arrested them not with his hands with his words oh they said never man spake like this man you know when you go to church and a fellow preaches you expect him to get up and recite a few things and particularly the doctrine of his own church and he's nice and he's kind and he smiles and he wants to shake hands with everybody going out and if it's near Christmas he doesn't want to offend anybody he may not get Christmas gifts the preacher goes in there he's not offering people a prize he's not saying uh, uh, if you feel disposed to accept Jesus we will be very glad to receive your membership he offers you an ultimatum it's not an option you either become a member of the kingdom of God or perish but oh these days we must not offend people well Jesus isn't a big concern about offending people at all I'm not come to destroy the law and the prophets he says I'm come to fulfill now he says if you hunger and thirst after righteousness we should be filled filled with what? filled with everything that the human heart craves for number one it craves for peace and there is no peace outside of Jesus Christ none I don't care who the man is I don't care what his philosophy is there is no peace until the Prince of Peace comes to set up his kingdom in our heart there is no joy oh you should see us when we have TV on how we laugh that's not joy that's entertainment and much of it shows the barrenness of people's intellects these days the very things that we covet most the external things don't mean too much where your treasure is there will your heart be well what's your heart filled with tonight dross huh? worldly ambition what's it filled with after all this is treasure city in here what you have outside socially pff, that doesn't matter that much to God now Jesus is saying to these men oh brother they were Pharisees indeed except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees so he doesn't say uh, if your uh, righteousness is different 
It says, accept your righteousness, exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. I used to work with a, with, in, a, in a factory where there were 8,000 people and almost 6,000 were Jews and, and I got to know some of the habits, some of the customs. I used to eat bagels and hum and tash and all kinds of stuff. Every feast they brought a different kind of cake and I used to enjoy it. It was free and that's one reason. <clears throat> but I used to enjoy it because they were always so delicious. And you know, sometimes they talk about the Ten Commandments. Now, you know, there are people who say that when Jesus came, the old law was destroyed. The first revised version of the Bible was the reversed version of the Bible. Do you know that in the second century of Christianity, as we call it, there was a man by the name of Marcion, and he rewrote the whole of the New Testament, leaving out everything that referred to the Old Testament. Everything. Do you imagine? That's a task for you. Now, when I was a little boy, which is about 200 years ago, as I feel tonight, but anyhow, when I was a little boy, we were taught about the Old and New Testament like this. The new is in the old concealed. The old is by the new revealed. You see, whatever the law and the prophets said about the sacrifices, Jesus is the fulfillment of all their sacrifices. Whatever they said about, about the priests, Again, you remember the, the, the epistle to the Hebrews where the writer says, strengthen the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Why not? Because all these Jews recently converted were, 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 were beginning to feel a bit upset, you know, and beginning to think, well, after all, are, are our relatives right? Are we wrong? Have we got hooked on a, on a cult, as we'd say today? Imagine one man goes down the street, let's call him Abraham, not the old Abraham, and a, another man, Isaac, not his son, and Abraham says, hey, Isaac, you, you haven't been to the synagogue for a while. I, I hear you're going to that new group up that back street there. You know, they didn't have a 17 million glass palace. <clears throat> Some people have, but he, he, they didn't have that. They had an old shanty, it didn't have stained glass windows, it didn't have a rogue choir, it didn't have a rug all through it. It maybe was very near to the stable Jesus was born in, but oh mercy, did they worship and adore the Lamb and worship God. This Jew says, you act now look here. You know what people are always try to get at you? I mean, you're too intelligent to be a Christian. I thought most people were too intelligent to go to hell, but they're not. I mean, do you, do you accept the Christian teaching? Yes. Well, now, listen, Abraham, I don't want to steamroll you, but you know, <laughs> you, you don't have any temple like we have. Look, there's a high priest going in the temple. Oh, by the way, you don't have a high priest. Oh, by the way, you don't have a sacrifice. And he goes on and the poor Christian begins to feel, you know, a little as though he's been having his clothes, his covering ripped off him. And then he says, well, are you through? And he says, yes. <laughs> well, he said, now let me tell you the good news. <coughs> What's the good news? We have a temple. You have a temple? Oh, is it that new place? They're building just up the street called Straight? No, no, no. Well, where's the temple? You're looking at it. You mean you're the temple? Yes. God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He dwells in human personality. Well, you don't have a great high priest. Ah, yes, we do. Well, he hasn't shed any blood. Oh, yes, he has. As a matter of fact, he shed his own blood once. You have to keep doing the same old silly thing year after year after year after year. And our high priest just once made a sacrifice. And our high priest ascended. Your priest dies every few years. Our priest never dies. And boy, he turns it all over and says, you think I've left everything? Man, I've got everything. <coughs> uh, in, in the words of Scripture again, I found the pearl of great price. Now, when Jesus is talking about these things, remember, they're all internal. You know, the Pharisees used to wear phylacteries. I remember when I used to travel a lot, I went on a train from New York well, it was that beautiful silver bullet train that goes down the eastern seaboard. And I got on that train that night. It was the longest night of my life, I think. I was poor, you know. I couldn't afford to go to bed. And I sat up on that chair. And I sat down on the chair. And I turned round the chair. And good night. I don't know what I didn't do. About five o'clock in the morning, I thought, oh, I'll have a wash. I'll feel fresh before we get to West Palm Beach where I'm getting off the train. And I went in there. And there was a guy with a scarf round his neck and a phylactery, a box on his forehead and a box on this arm, and he carefully had the two pieces of leather in his fingers there, and he was going through his... I thought, well, bless you at least. You're very brave about it. 
you're not a Pharisee, you didn't stand in the middle of the train, he was there in the, in the, in the men's washroom, and there he was going through his spiritual ablution. Do you remember Jesus talked about the Pharisees who made broad their phylacteries in case anybody didn't see them? Do you know the, they, they, they wore one little box here with scriptures on their left arm so that when they put their hands up, the law was very near to their heart. Well, that's the very thing Jesus is arguing against. It's all on the outside with you. I write my law on the fleshy table of your heart. Well, well, they had the Ten Commandments. Yeah, that's true, they had the Ten Commandments. Do you know what else they had? They made 248 new commandments of their own. Boy, it must have been difficult trying to remember them all, don't you think? But on top of that, they had 365 prohibitions. That makes about 500 and what? I don't know, 503 or 506 laws and prohibitions which they had made. If they were gathering mint in the garden, they tied a bunch up. The old Pharisee sat there and said, how many bunches is that? That's nine. No, I think it's eight. Count them again. Count them again. Nine. Ten. That one's for God. Nine. Ten. That one's for God. <coughs> Jesus said, you tied your mint and you're coming. You count your apples and put one in a box for God. I don't know how he got them, but one in a box for God, one in a box for God. They were very meticulous about it. Now Jesus says, you, you keep up all the external things. But you remember one day he used a very disgusting analogy. He said, you Pharisees are like whited sepulchres. You know, in the East they always put whitewash, a, a white lime on the outside, so you know there was a corpse in there. And Jesus says, you keep it all clean and you put flowers round. I often wonder why they take flowers to graves. I mean, the folk in the graves don't get up and smell them, do they? Why do they do it? As dear old Van Tavenen says, I, in his drawl, I can't imitate it, is the drawl there from South Carolina he lives way up in the hills but he says I never understood cemeteries they put an iron railing around them I don't know why because people outside don't want to get in and people inside can't get out so what's the good of iron railing we do a lot of strange things don't we and yet the strangest thing of all is that people will go for the external you know what would happen today if we wore all war phylacteries We'd have, we'd have got little pearls round them, or diamonds round them. We'd have embroidered them. We'd make them out of plastic. You say, I don't think so. We'd have more reverence. Well, tell me why people wear the cross when many of them are blasphemers. Why do they decorate the cross of Jesus with diamonds? At least I'd put rubies there to remember the blood. But I've seen ladies, I remember a lady came to our fellowship. She had rings on her fingers and bells on her toes, as the, as the uh, nursery rhyme says. And she came one day with a cross about this length a huge cross her children didn't know what to buy her so they bought her a cross about four inches it must have been uh, a quarter or three eighths thick of solid pure gold what good is a cross outside the cross has to be on the inside wearing a cross outside some people wear it you know oh if i forget to wear my cross i might have an accident today you might have one. Somebody might snatch it off your neck if you're in New York. They tell me down in Miami, women don't wear chains around the necks anymore. As a matter of fact, in New York, uh, I think 400 were stolen in a little over a week. A woman was actually choked because she had a deep necklace on and the man that tried to snatch it, uh, he, he dragged her on the street and she choked on it. But you see, people are so superstitious. If I wear a cross somewhere, the cross is a curse. He said clearly there in Galatians, cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. The symbol of the church of Jesus Christ is a tongue of fire. But Jesus again is going out to, the, 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 to, the, uh, to these disciples and saying, listen, I, I am going to fulfill the law and the prophets. What did the prophets prophesy? Well, uh, Isaiah prophesied a, a, a word perfect picture of the crucifixion 800 years before Jesus was born that Jesus was crucified who hath believed our report to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed he shall go up before him as a tender plant as a root out of a dry ground he hath no form nor comeliness and there is no beauty that we should desire him he is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief thou hast made his soul an offering for sin not his body people look at the blood running from his head from his hands 
and we sing it, see from his head, his hands, his feet. But that wasn't the sacrifice, it was Saul that was made an offering for sin. We were dead, he had to die in order to bring us life. And, and if you read carefully through the law and the prophets, what do you discover? You discover the law is three things. It's doctrinal, and it's prophetical, and it's ethical. All the doctrine of the Old Testament consummates in Jesus Christ. Ever noticed, if you get a very good map of America, that all the roads seem to end up in New York. You see all these red lines go up, and there's streaks and streaks of red, and they all end up. And if it's a good map, and it's bigger than, uh, than America, you'll see a lot of black lines going out, and, and it'll show you a sweep like that, and it will say, uh, Cape Town, Africa, or some other place in Africa, you know, 8,400 miles away, uh, Honolulu so far through the Suez Canal. Everything converges into New York from the land side. Everything leaves New York to go to the ends of the earth. All history, in one sense, ends at the manger of Jesus Christ. All prophecy begins at that manger. Jesus was before the world began. He was incarnate, that is, he's, he, he's God made manifest in the flesh. And when he comes, he begins to speak prophetically of things that will happen. Now this is the foundation actually here, this is the foundation of his, of his eternal kingdom. And there's only one way into that kingdom, that's in the, uh, referred to of God, in the gospel recorded by John. What shall I do to enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, do you remember what Paul says in, in the, what, the 14th of Romans? That the kingdom of heaven is not meat and drink, but righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. Do you think the world was ever more, more in a mess than it is now? What do the Russians say, uh, the Chinese say they have a million men on the border between themselves and Russia? Ninety divisions of men outside of Poland right now. Oh, we forgot all about, we forgot all about Afghanistan. We spent hours talking about a piece of something went up and it came down again, so what? And yet people were slaughtered and destroyed in Afghanistan all day today. But that doesn't make news stale. Cambodia was raped and people there are dying like flies, but so what? Uh, gasoline's gone up two cents today. It's amazing how we get out unbalanced. It's amazing how unrighteous the world is. It's it amazing that men still prefer to commit suicide, whether they do it shortly or long, in the long run. They still prefer to live without inward peace, without inward joy. Jesus comes to set up the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is within you, he says. It's not visible to the natural eye. It's like Jesus again going into Jerusalem and they say, well, uh, <laughs> I mean, what chance has this fellow of being a king? Uh, do you happen to know his address? Does he live in a castle? Huh? Does he have a bodyguard? I don't see it. Does he have financial backing? Everybody despises him. Yeah, but I reminded you Sunday morning, if you're there, about the man that was preaching in North Philadelphia some months ago. Uh, the, the church is a big church, black people almost entirely, and the preacher there's a superman, he's a black man. The assistant is a white man, about 34 years of age. He has an earned PhD, he's quite a preacher. And, and he preached in one of these conferences, you know, they preached from nine at morning till nine at night with breaks in between. And uh, this, this white man was to preach before the, his old boss there was going to preach after him. And when the young man sat down, he said, I thought I'd had the best time in my life. And he says, when I sat down, I just leaned over to my senior pastor and said, uh, can you top that? And he just said, boy, you ain't heard anything yet. And he said, he got up and all he said for about an hour was, it's Friday now, but Sunday's coming. And he said he went on that and developed it till he had that place, just a hive of power, you could feel the anointing of God. And all he would say was, now they're bringing Jesus through the door. He has a torn purple garment on him and his, his brow's all sweaty and bloody and he has a reed in his hand. It's Friday now, but Sunday's coming.
obviously meaning this is the death, Sunday's coming, the resurrection. And then he got him before Herod, and there's Herod in all his glory. It's Friday now, but Sunday's coming. And then he had him up before Pilate, it's Friday now, but Sunday's coming. And all the people were scorning him, and everything he said, he, he backed it up with, it's Friday now, but Sunday's coming. And he said, at last they've got him on the cross. And he said, it is finished. And he paused and he said, it's Friday now. And the whole congregation yelled back, but Sunday's coming. <laughs> well, I'd have jumped out of my seat. If I'd been there, I'm sure that would have set me on fire. And you know, I, as I said Sunday, when, when people think of, oh, come on, you say, you say he's the king of glory. You know, when Isaac Watts wrote that hymn first, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, on which the Prince of Glory died, he didn't write that at all. What he wrote was, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, where the young Prince of Glory died, because he was still young. And they see him come into the city on the back of a donkey. And I feel like saying, Yes, brother, it's Friday now, but Sunday's coming. Because Revelation 6, 6 tells me that same Christ is going to come sweeping through the skies on a white horse to take dominion over the whole earth. When, as John Ellington said, earth's proud empires have passed away. Keith was saying tonight something about, was it Exxon that had made a, how many billion was it? 103. 103. 103. He, he keeps checking on that. He must have some stock in it. He won't admit it. But anyhow, <laughs> as $103 billion they made, like, man, that's more than the whole nation made in profit. Outside, I think, of that one company. $103 billion? <laughs> But the voice of Jesus, it's all going to be ended like that. Earth's proud empires pass away. He's going to rule us. Again, it was Isaac Watts that wrote the hymn, Jesus shall reign where the sun doth its successive journeys run. His kingdom's going to stretch from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more. Now, this, this righteousness, it, it, it's the miracle of God. You know, a few years ago, uh, Freud startled the world with his amazing ideas of psychology and he said we need a new depth in psychology and somebody came up and said we need more than that we need, we need a new depth in morality and I say more than that we need a new depth in spirituality and brother you get down to the deepest things when you get into this chapter that the righteousness of God can be revealed in us through the death of Jesus Christ <clears throat> for after all that's what John says that he that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous look at Jeremiah you've got your Bible there look at Jeremiah 31 and verse 33 <clears throat> this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days saith the Lord I will put my law in their inward parts you don't have to wear it on your forehead you don't have to wear it strapped to your left wrist. You don't have to wear it woven into your belt. You see people today with the name in their belt woven at the back. You know they used to wear weave scriptures into the belts years ago? Starting scriptures. And God makes a promise here that you won't need the law outside. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now look at Ezekiel 36. And in verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Now here is that which exceeds everything the law and the prophets ever knew anything about. It was all external. Now he says, I'm coming to take up residence in your heart. But after all, there's only one way to do that, and that's when the, when the heart has been cleansed. But even when the heart has been cleansed and the spirit abides, then we start getting on the stretch for God. A man was telling me the other day, he'd been to London and he'd been up City Road there and he'd been in that famous historic church of John Wesley. There's a monument there to, uh, showing John preaching. His mother's buried across the road. It must be the world's most amazing uh, graveyard there. John, um, let me see, is John Bunyan buried there? I believe he is. Daniel Defoe, remember him? He wrote Robinson Crusoe, that classic you all read. 
and uh, he's buried there. I said, what is buried there? Mrs. Wesley is buried there. Ah, there's going to be a row at resurrection morning when they all get up. The founder of the Quakers is buried there. What a wonderful old place. What, what a gathering of the saints there is there. Okay, what I'm going to say about that is this, that the true sign of health was stated by a man who followed John Wesley, not right after Wesley. As a matter of fact, he preached in my early days. <coughs> He was a man with what I call with an elastic vocabulary. He had a colossal, fascinating, you know, he didn't use hackneyed dry words. He, uh, he, he wouldn't talk about scents, he talked talk about perfume. He always had a, a, a better word, a kind of a college word, you know. And uh, he fascinated the crowd. People used to listen to him. And I remember just one thing he said. He said this, the man who only wants his sins forgiving is toying with religion time with religion well he wants us to run away from guilt and condemnation but the man who really has a heart has a heart like the psalmist look at psalm 63 and verse 1 there maybe you know it by heart God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee, my soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee, in a dry and a thirsty land where no water is. Psalm 84 and verse 2. How amiable are thy court, uh, thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. Verse 2, my soul longeth thee, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Now, come on, you can find out where, you, where, where your spiritual life is. is. Is it theological? Just today, somebody said to me, well, after all, it's not much good having it all in your head. Is it working out? I mean, you know, what have I done for God today? Not have I printed so much? Not have I preached so much? Have, have I really satisfied God? He thirsts for my fellowship. Do I thirst for him? Is that number one priority in my life? My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. I think it was Robert Murray McShane, that famous Scotsman who died, I think, at 29 years of age, who said that anything that didn't have eternity in it wasn't worth his time. Do you know what it means? It means that the priority in his life is to hunger and to thirst after the living God. And Paul says the same thing. What does he say? He says that I may know him, <coughs> doesn't he? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Do you remember that scripture in which uh, Moses says, even after he's seen the revelations of God, and he's still thirsting after God, we've seen the deliverances of God, but, but in his prayer he doesn't say, Lord, give me a greater ministry. He doesn't say, Lord, I want to see more miracles. He says, show me thy glory with all that he's seen of God's manifest power in delivering them from Israel, with all the miracles he's seen, he says, Lord, but show me yourself, show me thy glory. Uh, and the chapter after, it says he came down from the mountain. Well, he was 80 years of age, you know, and he may have had a wrinkle or two. And yet it says when he came from the mountain, he had to get a, a, a veil and cover his face. Like Jesus had a transfiguration on the Mount of Transfiguration. He had a transfiguration. He radiated the, the glory and beauty of God at 80 years of age. Do you remember the apostles when they came out of the upper room and they'd been around doing their work and the people puzzled about them and then they said, well, I'll tell you what. There's only one explanation for these people. They've been with Jesus. I think that's great. I remember getting on a bus in England, it was a dirty day, oh mercy, what a day. And it was down in a dark part near Manchester, and I got on this bus, I was already wet through, there was not much point getting on the bus, except I get home a bit quicker. And when I got on, I... Oh, mm. oh mercy, it was almost filled with women, I thought, they must all have a bunch of roses, no, no roses there. But the fragrance. 
I know no Avon ladies in those days, you know. <clears throat> and that bus was, didn't stink of tobacco like usual. It was, then I noticed when a lady uh, pulled a coat, oh, she had a red, uh, a white jacket underneath with a red collar. And I looked, ah, oh, they've all got red collars. Oh, yes, at the end of this road, uh, less than two miles away, uh, is the firm that makes English leather soap and English leather perfumes. Oh, so when, as they're coming out, they get a squirt and go, crap, 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 and squirt, everybody come out. No, they don't. Into their clothes. And when they got in a bus all together, they changed the atmosphere. Well, isn't that what happened with the early disciples? They took knowledge of them that they'd been with Jesus. All the qualities that were in Jesus were working out in them. Well, isn't that exactly what this is all about? Jesus doesn't abolish the law, he, he, he perpetuates the law. He doesn't write it again on phylacteries that we wear on our foreheads and on our arms. He writes it on the fleshy table of our hearts. And you know what's inside is going to come out. You can say, I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm living a holy life, and then suddenly you bump into someone and you tear away, and suddenly, oh, well, he, uh, she put a sanctification on one side for five minutes, or ten minutes. No, 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 if it's inside, it will come out. We, we had a very rough fellow converted not far from where I lived. He was a typical Yorkshireman, and they're pretty rough. I'm a Yorkshireman, so that's why I'm rough. And, uh, and he got marvelously saved. And at the Bible school I went to a little college, the professor there said he was, this man was the only fool that God ever sanctified. Because he had the most senseless humor, he'd get up in a meeting and he'd tell ten jokes right off. You know. And I remember one night I was in a meeting and he said, well, I saw a strange thing today. I was out at a farm there. And he said, I heard a duck and she was quack, 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 quack. And he said, after I came, about eight little ducklings, tiny little things, and, and they went down to the edge of the farm, and he said, man, they were waggling more than ducks. And he said to the farmer, what happened? And he said, well, uh, I'll tell you what, that, that duck really isn't the mother of the ducks. The, 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 the mother's there, look, that hen running after them. And here's the old hen coming up full speed, you know, trying to get the duck away from them. And he said, what happened was that the duck that was laying the eggs uh, got run over with a farm wagon. And uh, there was a hen just round the corner, and a boy kicked a football, and it went and smashed all the eggs. So we put the duck eggs under the hen, and she hatched them all out. And she never had any kids like that before. I mean, you know, they weren't a bit like the other kids she'd had. They were... They had little duck tails and they looked funny and the first thing they did was shoot for the water. And he said when they got there they had one foot in the water and they had the other one on the, on the sand and they were going round the pool, pool saying cock-a-doodle quack, cock-a-doodle quack, <laughs> cock-a-doodle quack. And you know everybody laughed and he says well that's like some of you, you have one foot in the world and other foot on land he said and God doesn't know where you are and Diddle doesn't know where you are so come on. <laughs> Well, it's a rough illustration, but I think it bears out what, what's true in many lives. The one foot in the land and one foot in the water. But you know, as a lady said to me the other day on the phone, a lady called me the other night, she's a very wealthy lady, I believe a multi-millionaire, and, and she wrote something about reading last day's newsletter. As she read it, she said, it's great, I've read it, I've passed it on to friends, they've sent in their names for it, and we're quite excited about the paper that she was checking up about something that had happened in somebody's life and she said, I don't understand it. Because when I was born again, I became a new creature. God doesn't give us a new part, he gives us a new heart. We don't turn over a new leaf, we get a new life. He comes to govern, he comes to rule, he comes to abide, he comes to indwell. And in a crooked and perverse world like this, God wants to establish his righteousness we live in a world of unrighteousness we live in a world of self-righteousness but this is God's righteousness made possible by the blood of Christ made possible by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that now we can be faithful to the laws of God we can please our Heavenly Father 
Isn't that what we delight to do? I delight to please my wife. Anything I can do. Sometimes when it's gardening, I backslide. But uh, <coughs> other times I like to uh, I like to please my wife. So uh, watch out now, uh, Martin. Uh, <coughs> but that's the law of life. Yeah, and it, it works the other way sometimes. But uh, <coughs> that's the way it should. If you're really in love with a person, you want to obey them. You want to do as they uh, whatever delights them. And Paul says we can delight in the inner man as much as we delight it for the things of the world, as much as we delight it for the unlawful, unclean, unseemly things. We've received a new life, we've received a new nature. And I've told the story and finished with it. Our boys, we were in Ireland at my, fa- my wife's father's <coughs> place, and we went to what they call the bog. They cut out this turf and then they let the water go in, you know, and uh, we were going down this lovely lane, beautiful spring day, and there were some rushes, uh, they were about this height, and they were within reaching distance, and they were about eight feet of water, you know, and I got hold of the branch of a tree, and boy, did I grip it. The boys wanted me to get this rush, and I pulled this rush out, and as I did, a, a, a dragonfly came, oh man, I, I ducked as though it was an aeroplane. Oh, the boys weren't interested in me, they weren't interested in, the, in getting the bull rush out, they said, what, 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 what was that? Uh, it was a dragonfly. Mm. Well, where does it live? How old would it be? Where did it come from? You know, all the kids. Kids can find out how ignorant you are very quickly. And uh, and, and so I said, uh, well, let me see. As far as I know, let's see. The mother dragonfly went over this uh, pond, this murky pond, uh, some months ago, and she dropped an egg, and it went right to the bottom of the pond in the mud, and it stayed there so many months, and and then it it, it came to the surface, and uh, it has a buoyancy, and then the sun dries it, and it opens like that, and out comes that beautiful, beautiful double-winged dragonfly. And it was coming back. And it dipped right down near the water. I said to the boys, do you think he wants to go back there? I think it was David who said, no, Daddy, he wouldn't want to go back in all that mire and muck and dirt down there, would it? I said, I don't think so. Look at the flowers round here. Oh, the wild roses and other things. The honeysuckle was fragrant. I think it's enjoying being up here. It's come out of the darkness and muck and mire. Well, if a man is a new Christ in Christ, do you think he wants to go back in the muck and in the mire? Into the filth? Into rebelling against God? Into eating dry crusts of newspaper instead of the living springs of water from the Word of God? If he's in Christ, he's a new creation. But that's not enough. He reaches, because the Apostle Paul reached heights, I guess, that few people have ever reached, and, and he's still, after being the greatest man living in the world at that day, he's still saying, but I may know him. These fellows that went up in that uh, piece of tin the other day, they're, uh, they're going to check them up for nine days. What did you see the other astronauts didn't see? What, 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 what do you think is the next thing? We believe we're going to get to a star. Well, you can do it. Take 2,000 years, you'll have to build a maternity block in a cemetery in the in the thing that goes up, at least you'll have to have a maternity block if you're going to have anybody. Nobody's going to live long enough to get up there anyhow, and you couldn't get there in less than 2,000 years in the present rocket system. I don't think we'll ever get on stars. I don't think there's time. I think Jesus is going to come before that anyhow. Okay, the two final things. What did he say about those who are indwelt with his righteousness? He said, I want to put you on exhibition. That's what Paul says. We are made a spectacle to the world. God isn't going to convince the world by angels flying around the sky. He's got to convince the world through the church of the living God when it really is salt. When it really is the light of the world. That's what it's all about. And he doesn't want to purify me just for my own satisfaction. He doesn't want to fill me with his Holy Spirit that I may feel, well, thank God, I don't, I don't do the lousy sins I used to and I'm not peevish and selfish and backbiting and unlovely. I've got all these graces of God in my life and now I can just relax and be raptured. No, 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 no. He wants to put me in exhibition. The father and mother in the home. The school teacher in, the, in, 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 in her particular job. Working over as you do in the print shop or somewhere else. <coughs> or in your home or in your factory. He wants to put us on exhibition. So that your life, something throws out of it, even when your lips are silent, there's something about your disposition, there's something about your graciousness. Somebody has said that love is something the deaf can hear and the blind can see. I think that's a nice definition. 
And after all, it, it, it's what the world needs more than anything. What can we do now? We've got TVs, all we get is a five foot screen in the house. What else can we do? Winky's got a machine there, a gadget he was showing me the other day, he works on, it can register 80, 80 million, I don't know what call them, what do you call them, Keith, vibrations or something, a second? 80 million a second, and the new one that's coming up in about two years will register 800 million in a second? And some guy with a brain like mine, only more polished, made that. You see, one of the signs of the end of the age is knowledge shall increase. Well, I bet you, I'm not old, I'm antique. You know, when I was a kid, there were no airplanes. There was no radio, no TV. We were sensible, we went to bed like the animals do. When it gets dark, got up like the do. When it gets light, slept longer in winter and shorter in summer. That, that's God's way. We think we're smart because we've turned night into day. That's the most idiotic thing we've done. Health has gone down ever since the electric light started. <laughs> We've tried to conquer the world. It's another act of rebellion. We're not going to do as God says. Go to sleep at the right time. Get up at the right time. To hell with all those things. We're going to go our own way. Man, if you filter out all the rebellion against God, you'll be staggered. And so what God wants to do is to come into these hearts of ours. As I said last week, blessed are the meek, and, and we've changed that to blessed are the weak. There's nobody stronger than a meek man or a meek woman. Moses was the meekest man in the world, but he got angry when they made a golden calf. He got angry when they left the true God. Thy king cometh unto thee, meek and lowly, sitting upon an ass. And the next thing you find him in the temple, whipping them. And before he whipped, he wept. And if you and I are going to whip folk, let's be careful that we weep before we whip them. That's the, that's the divine order. We live in an ugly world. A world that could be at peace, but it rejects the Prince of Peace, therefore there is no peace. We've more money sunk in armaments at this moment, we've more men wearing uniforms than any period in history. Don't you think it's the height of insanity that when we've got all these gorgeous buildings and art collections that somebody can drop a, a bomb on a city and liquidate four or five thousand years of history? Pictures that could never be repainted, art collections we could never put back to shape again? And above all, that we destroy millions of people. It's not God's fault. And the only way we'll convince men and women that this thing works is when it works in our own lives. And when the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ is seen in us. Well, we're through now. The Lord be with you. Come to the wedding Saturday morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the provision you've made through your only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We're glad we don't have to wear signs on our foreheads, on our arms, but, oh God, we pray that that inward sign of the cross may work out because we have a meek and a lowly spirit and the beauty of the Lord our God may be upon us, that we'll stand for your righteousness in this unrighteous world. Bless again the fellowship here. We pray it will go from strength to strength. Bless each one of us now in Jesus' name. Amen.